Okay, so hello and welcome to the Argyle um, Women in Agricultural meeting tonight. Um, tonight we're hosting our Motivate and Inspire event, which is one in a series of 13 um, being run across all of the FAS um, Women in Ag groups across Scotland. Um, the aim of these events is to help build confidence among the attendees, um, to help them to not be afraid to step out of their comfort zone, try something new, or different, or even just change their current practices. Um, after tonight's event, event, there's still three of these to run across Scotland. Um, so keep an eye out on the FAS website um, and social media for full details of those, those events that are still to happen. Um, there is some of the previous events from the series on the FAS website as recordings, um, so you can catch up on those um, via the website. So tonight we're joined by four uh, fantastic women um, who are all farming and crofting in um, Argyle and the islands um, and they're going to tell us a bit about their stories, their backgrounds and, and how they've, they've come to where they are now. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly introduce them by, by name alone and then they'll they'll fill us in on the rest of their, their stories. So first up tonight we'll have Rhoda Meek, um, she's from Tyree. Um, secondly speaking will be Geraldine McKinnon from the Isle of Canna. Third, we'll have Claire Simonetta from Mull, and last but not least, we'll have Jane Isaacson from Burkholden. Um, this is a webinar, it's been set up as a webinar rather than a meeting on Zoom. Um, so any questions that you have as we go along, you can use the chat function um, along the side and we'll keep an eye on that. Um, but we'll also have lots of time at the end for discussion and more questions um, to the panellists at that point. Um, because this event's been run through the Farm Advisory Service, all, all feedback's really greatly appreciated um, and we'll be sending out a post-evaluation um, form by email um, and I'm really grateful if you could take the time just to fill that in. And there is a prize draw for everybody, um, you'll be entered into a prize draw for vouchers um, for everybody that, that fills in the forms just as a wee um, token and <laughs> trying to encourage folk to fill them in for us. Um, so the last, lastly, um, this has been recorded tonight, but it only records the speakers, so um, you don't need to, to fret about that side of things, and it, it will go up onto the website later. If, if anybody needs to disappear at any point, you can catch up um, when it appears on the website. So I'm not going to say any more, really. I'm just going to hand over to Rhoda now. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much, Morbin, um, and thank you for the, the opportunity as well um, to, to kind of chat with you. Um, I am just going to share my screen um, and kind of talk you through a little bit of, of my, my life, I guess. It's a sunny Tyree this evening, but it was absolutely horrible um, this morning. So I'm glad it's improved. Um, yeah, I'm Rhoda Meek. And I guess I was trying to figure out how to describe what I do. Um, I have four strands, I guess, to life. Um, IT consultancy is, is one of the things I do. And um, you might wonder why I'm using this particular bit of software. Um, this is actually the company I work for as an IT consultant. It's called Whimsical. And if you ever want to um, make some sort of mind map, flowchart, Darren, you will probably come and talk to me. Oh my word, is it is the internet here? Yes? No? I can hear you, but it's uh, breaking up. Of course it is. That's why I get <laughs> having a broadband meeting tonight or sending you anything. Okay. Um, yeah, so I work in IT and this is the, the company I work for. Um, I solve problems for customers. I tell engineers about the problems and then I repeat the answers back to, to the customers. And um, so I kind of translate for engineers. Um, Trainee Crofter, I guess, is the, the kind of most important place to start. Um, here's, a, here's a great place to start. I was born and brought up in Edinburgh. But um, my sister and I came back to the family house on a very regular basis. Um, my grandmother was here until the late 80s. My father was born and brought up here. But from the late 80s onwards, nobody, nobody lived in the house. And so I um, would come back in the summers, my mum and dad, and they would try and clear the croft and keep a, a roof on the house. And um, I 
my sister and I kind of ran wild a little bit in Tyree. I don't think the fashion sense has got any better. Thankfully, my hair has got a little bit shorter. Um, Colview has been here since 1981. This is a photo of, of it from the um, 1920s, we think. And it, we, we have been in the Croft for, for slightly longer than that. So if we go back um, in time a little bit, um, entirely, we are down here in Postban, um, back in the ruins of the kind of furthest bit that we can track our family back to. And that's, that's my dad there. Um, we have a really long history, I guess, here. Um, my great great grandfather built the house and blasted the stone from the croft. Um, I reckon his wife wore the trousers, Euphemia. Um, she is is quite a, was quite a strong woman by the looks of it. Um, and the picture of them hangs in my kitchen to remind me to uh, to behave myself. Um, and that's my dad in younger years um, with the grey Ferguson tractor that, that we still have on the croft. So yeah, um, I moved back in 2013 um, to a pretty cold, damp house where not a lot, um, there's not a lot going for it, to be fair. Um, and the fireplace that you see there um, is actually the, the fireplace behind me right here. And so we took the house back to the stone and down to the dirt and we started again. And it took the best part of um, five years to get there um, and for most of that I didn't have any hot running water. Um, it was a challenge. We, we did every, I did everything myself right down to kind of stripping the walls. Um, I got other people in though to, yeah this is, this is where we got to, I got other people in though to rebuild it and um, that process, that's the stove finally going in which was a pretty good feeling. Um, and yeah, we, we, we made good progress. In 20 17, um, I got my first sheep and they were Hebridean ewes and they came from the Isle of Gunna and you can see Gunna just out of my window, it's across the across the sound between, between Tyree and Col and there's a flock of Hebridean ewes there. They're not native to, to that island, the person who owns the island likes them and has them. Um, but they were they're essentially feral. Um, I, I got 20 of them home and, and they took 62 days to bucket train. I know because I, I, I swore for almost every single one of those 62 days. They came back in a boat um, and that's them in, in Tyree. And 2015, I had started some doing some kind of growing some veg. We called it Fresh Off the Croft. And I thought it'd be quite fun to see if we could do veg boxes in a wee market garden. Um, and that ran up until last year, actually, when COVID arrived and disrupted things and other projects um, that I had meant that it just wasn't really feasible. My first year's lambing, um, that was Vader. He'll pop up again. Um, and that's the house completed. So that's kind of where where we got to. There's the veg. There's the mum and dad um, when we finally finished the house in uh, the same year as my as my dad's 70th birthday, which was pretty cool. Um, and I've started to crossbreed the sheep. So I started with 20 Hebridean ewes and I have now ended up with a flock of um, nine fewer today. They went to, to Bada for mutton. So that's the first of my homegrown mutton um, gone to Bada. Um, that's one of my Hebridean ewes with a little off the shoulder number and the others are Texel crosses. That's Vader now. He's big. He's a wedder who um, very much has a mind of his own and he's actually one of my most useful tools on the croft. He um, keeps the ram quiet and wherever Vader goes, everything else follows um, and Vader will follow anything that rustles. That's this year's lambs, um, who are quite um, feisty looking bunch. So on the, on the right, we've got one of the, the Hebtex crosses and her lamb, um, who's coming rather nice this year, and then one of the Hebrideans and her three quarter Hebridean. So um, yeah, they're they're fun sheep. They're feisty and they can think. Um, they, they don't let anything get past them. Um, rather beautiful fleeces as well. This is one of my early um, crosses, and this was them um, getting shorn this year. So um, it's been a pretty exciting 
journey um, in terms of the craft anyway over the, the last few years. Um, what I knew about crafting, um, about most things actually that I do day to day now, you could have written on the back of a postage stamp when I arrived in Tyree. Um, and I'm not sure that I know much more now, but I'm definitely learning um, on a very a very regular basis still. These are um, two of the best tools in my in my toolkit, a pickup and um, an old Leyland who um, I call imaginatively Layla. And this is one of the pictures that actually means a huge amount to me. Um, took it this year, um, just as we finished baling last week. And it was a kind of older school style of baling with four of us chipping in and wrapping and moving bales. And just seeing the tractor, the house painted, the bales there. I don't know. It, it, it just felt really quite special to, to be feeling like I was kind of getting somewhere, I think, and, and learning. So yeah, that is the that is the the croft, and as part of that, um, I've done a few other little things. So one of the things um, I'm doing the mutton this year, um, I'm going to see if people like it. If not, I'll be eating quite a lot of mutton for the next couple of years. Um, I'm also hoping to do something with wool. I'm getting increasingly frustrated, as I'm sure many people are, with with the price of wool and and what what the options are around around wool. So I'm going to do some experimenting and see if I can figure out a little market for my wool. And over the last couple of years, um, I've been working on this concept called Tidy Tea, which are island inspired tea blends. And they um, mainly sell to tourists um, in Tidy, but also have been selling really well actually across Scotland this year and are being served in lots of lots of different cafes and restaurants. Um, I try and make it a little bit fun. Um, I tell little stories and on the main breakfast blend is um, the, the wee grey Fergie that's been on the croft since 1947. Um, so that, that feels kind of nice. Um, yeah, so plastic free tea bags um, and they are packed into their retail packs here um, on the croft. And uh, yeah, it's been that's been a really interesting journey and I'm looking forward to kind of growing that business a little bit. And then I guess the last thing I wanted to mention was that having um, IT skills and it turned out last year, a lot of tea bags and no customers meant that I am. Um, was daft enough to set up um, aisle 20. And aisle 20 is a shopping site. It started out as a business directory and it's now a shopping um, e-commerce site and it sells products from people across the Scottish islands supporting small businesses. And it started out as a project to help people sell during COVID. And um, it's, I think it's gonna hang around. I think we're gonna try, try um, doing, doing another, another year of business to see if we can um, sell on behalf of people um, in the off season as well so that's that plan um, and as part of that I turned it into a social enterprise um, called I'll develop and we're now trying to figure out what the the next project is um, I'm not very good at being bored um, I'm not very good at saying no I'm trying to get better at it um, but yeah I guess that's a whistle stop tour um, of of life for me and in Tyree, and I'm sorry the connection went funny. I should have had that broadband meeting tonight, shouldn't I? The, connect, the connection didn't go go that funny, don't worry. Um, fantastic. So as you can all see, Rhoda is um, a very busy lady um, with lots of strings to her bow. Um, and the the main aim for her is, is I think, I might put more words in your mouth here, Rhoda, but is to, to become sort of self self sufficient and be able to be self employed on and living full time on tidy. Would that be right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, tech is fun, but it's also quite stressful. Um, and yeah, I would love to reach a point where the various strands of what I'm doing um, would allow me to to kind of work, bring everything into the, the croft and, and my own sort of projects and, and mean that I didn't have to um, check in with anyone in Boston or Latvia or wherever they, they happen to be living. Good that that op opportunity is. Yep. Um, there's a, one question come in here for you, Rhoda. Um, what do you plan to try and do with the rule to increase the value? Ooh, that's an excellent question. Um, 
I am um, at the moment um, just quite basic knitting yarn is the plan. Um, and you've got some of that already, haven't you? Yeah, um, some of that is spun. Uh, Uh, for for that um, kind of I don't wait knitting yarn and then let's see next year maybe maybe a fabric would be quite interesting see if we could maybe add some value by then turning it into some household um, items that would allow us to to add someone else to the process and, and somebody else could get a job out of it as well so yeah we'll see um, a sub question to that is have you looked at some of the eco packaging options or yeah. using wool I don't know if you can hear me Rhoda sorry I can yeah sorry I was wondering if that's for tea or wool oh wool for wool no I haven't yet um, so I'm always happy to always happy to have a conversation if someone wants to tell me about it And but do you do it for the tea bags out of the trip yeah, so the tea bags are plastic free and biodegradable. Are um, degradable in the general waste stream. They've got quite a long use by on them, so we can't do fully compostable quite yet. But I'm waiting for the I'm waiting for the the the, the science to catch up. Brilliant. Okay, well we'll um, move on to our next speaker just now. Then, and if there's any further questions for Rhoda, we'll we'll have a chance at the end to to catch up um, and have a more sort of open discussion. So next up, we've got Geraldine McKinnon from the Isle of Canna. So I'll hand over to you, Geraldine. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, we a bit nervous about doing this, but anyway, I'll give it a go. <laughs> um, I've been uh, brought up in the Isle of Canna and uh, our family have been here forever, probably since the 1700s. And we are the last kind of indigenous um, Kana family and have been quite involved in running Kana Farm one way or the other over the last 50 years, 60 years. Um, when I left school, I worked on the farm for four years um, just as a general farm worker and then decided to head off to college to do a sheep management course at Kirkley Hall in Northumberland. And that was great. It just gave me a whole different insight to lots of different ways of doing stuff and different farms, different areas. And I eventually ended up shepherding in the borders outside of Hoyk for four or five years. Uh, did a wee change of direction then and worked in some riding schools and did some uh, British Horse Society exams and then decided to come back to Canada in 1996 and start up a trekking holiday business on um, our family croft. So we did that for a few years. And then in 2001, um, I started getting involved in managing Canna Farm and have been doing that ever since. Uh, I also have um, some sheep and cattle of my own, uh, built at Galloway Crosses and North Country Chibit Ewes. And we have some self-catering accommodation that we let out as well in our spare time. So it's great. It's great to be back on Canna. And um, yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's really good. And to run the farm in quite um, a different way than it traditionally has been managed. So we, we do a deferred grazing system and we... Um, that enables us to cut down on the amount of machinery we have, which um, people who are making hay and silage have all this machinery that's kind of sitting around in the salty West Coast air for most of the year. And we spend about a week trying to get it ready for going when you need it the next year. So we've cut all that out. We have quite a simplified system um, and it seems to work really well for us. Maybe not for everybody, but for us, it works really well. Um, we're producing store lambs and uh, calves that are sent off in the autumn. And um, yeah, no, it's good. 
so the farm is the you work for the National Trust for Scotland. Yes, um, I manage the farm for them on a con- contractual basis, and there's one and other a uh, full time employee, my niece uh, Caroline, and. Um, we're incredibly lucky because we have a really supportive community. So there's lots of people who want to come gathering and helping at shearing and just kind of get involved. And we get a lot of visitors. So it's a lot of people who come. Um, really like the fact that we are a working farm and they can see um, you out chasing cows or gathering up sheep or um yeah, and it's just nice to keep the farm clean and tidy and that visitors can enjoy it and it's just a nice place to be. So does the farm cover most of the island apart from the yeah. this the area of crofts or uh, yeah, there's three thousand acres in the farm, so that's pretty much the whole island. And there is an adjacent island, Sandy. Uh, which has a little road bridge across to it. So most of the crofts are over there where we are, where I live. Uh, So there's 10 crofts and we just run that as a kind of one unit. We kind of run everything together and everybody agrees and um, (laughs) just probably quite unusual in the crofting community, but yeah, it works for us. Brilliant. So quite a a cooperative for the the crofting side of things as well, if if you all work together. Is there 10 different crofters or...? Uh, no, there's five, five, five crofters. Um, and, but yeah, no, it works really well. Brilliant. And what about the, the deferred grazing? That's What kind of cattle have you got? Is it native breeds on the, on the farm? Uh, yes, we have um, some Highland, Highland cattle. Um, we have Aberdeen Angus crosses, uh, some shorthorn crosses. And we have 600 ewes, North Country Cheviot ewes. And which you, it, it used to be um, half the hairsel was blackface and half was Cheviot, but we've changed them all to Cheviot, uh, primarily because you get more money for a Cheviot lamb, more money for a Cheviot cast ewe, and slightly more money for Cheviot wool. And because we've got really good grazing, um, they can easily carry Cheviot ewes. Yep. It's too good for blackies. <laughs> <laughs> What sort of number of cattle is the farm running? Uh, the farm is uh, about 50 head of suckler cows. All spring calving? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And do you do fair grazing for the sheep as well, or is it just on the cattle or the sheep? Uh, just... Just, for the, just for the cattle. And how many years have you done that for now? Um, I've been doing this since um, 2001. Also yeah. quite a while. Brilliant. Yes, it was only supposed to be a temporary position, but it seems to have gone on and on. <laughs> well, if it works and it and it saves a lot of costs um, from a silage point of view, then well, I, th- I think it cuts out the worry of um, the weather and uh, machinery breaking down, and you know you're usually trying to shear sheep and make hay and silage at the same time, and um, we just don't have enough people so it's yeah. it's quite a um, streamlined kind of operation that kind of works works for here and we don't have the expertise to fix machinery or anything like that so yeah so I, was, it, I was just going to say Canada some of the islands are remote but Canada's probably very remote in the fact that you'll have what a couple of ferries a week uh, no, in the summertime, we actually get ferries yeah. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, twice on a Saturday and a Sunday. So it's really good. And then three times in the winter, which, which is fine. I mean, I, yeah. I think that's pretty good. So tell me a wee bit more about you're involved in the Canna Community Trust as well? Yes, the Isle of Canna Community Development Trust is was set up to kind of... Um, help us develop the community and try and make it more sustainable. Um, um, yeah. Um, I'm just not sure what I'm trying to say here. That's um, well, yeah. Try, trying to promote the community and the longevity of the community 
and uh, push forward projects that the community wanted to do. Like we've got a community shop, we've got a renewable energy um, company. So we are producing 98% of our um, power from renewables. Oh, and yeah. that's, that's owned and operated by the community, all 15 of us. <laughs> Is that all the population is in Canada? At the moment, yes. Wow. You know, desperately trying to get trying to increase. So that was a major project for us, and we, we did have a lot of help with it. So we have now been able to employ a development officer. Um, so that's been a huge uh, benefit to us because it's taken a lot of pressure off everybody struggling along trying to do all their own work and trying to do community projects as well. So we have loads of ideas in the pipeline, community housing and renovations. And uh, we've got 10 community moorings as well that um, we have in the harbour. And all the money that we get from these things is ploughed back into community projects. Brilliant. And we all work for nothing. <laughs> Lots of volunteer work. <laughs> it's all the same in, in these, in these uh, remote communities, isn't it? Yeah. And um, there's a question come in here for you um, to do with your trekking. So was it a, la a lack of time that caused you to give up the trekking or was it a lack of custom? I think at that time um, it was probably a wee bit of, um, I, I, at that time I was doing some work on the farm as well when I wasn't doing the trekking business and it was very, um, it was quite limited because I was having to feed the people and house the people and take them out trekking and do everything. So it was quite demanding. And um, yeah, advertising was really expensive. It was before you had, people had websites and all that kind of stuff. And then insurance and things. Yeah, there was, there was lots of different reasons. And I think actually I preferred working on the farm than taking people out horse riding. The public, that's, yeah, people, are, people you know. can be quite demanding. Animals are not quite so demanding. <laughs> they don't answer back. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it was great. It was great to, it was a great thing to do just to be able to go out and ride all around the island. And yeah, I think people quite enjoyed it. Do something you consider doing again, going back to? I, I personally wouldn't, but um, it might be an opportunity for somebody else to do it. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you very much, Geraldine. And um, there's another question come in from Lucy, but I'm just going to hold on to that one um, till the end because it's for all, all four uh, panellists. So we'll ask that one at the discussion in the end. Um, so next up, we have Claire Simonetta from Mull. Um, so I'll just hand you over to Claire. Now, Claire, do you want me to share the, the screen for you? Um, yes, please, yep. if that's possible. Thank you. Yep, no problem. So I'll I'll just get started. So hi everyone. Um, thanks very much for asking me along tonight. It's great to to be here, um, and I've really enjoyed listening to Rhoda and Geraldine already. Although it is a shame that we're not able to meet up face to face. Um, when Morvan asked me to be part of the panel tonight, I wasn't really sure um, what to talk about. Um, I don't really see my own story as particularly inspiring or motivational. But I guess my journey into agriculture here in Scotland is a little bit more unusual. Um, so I'll maybe just kind of talk about the journey mainly, but just to give you a quick overview. Um, I currently live uh, on the Isle of Mull uh, on my partner's tenanted hill farm. We've got approximately 3,200 hectares. Uh, mainly rough grazing. Um, we run just under a thousand uh, yows, mainly North Country Cheviots and some black face yows um, that were uh, breeding up to North Country Cheviots. And we've also got about 55 pedigree highland cows that are bred to the highland bull and the simmental bull. Um, we sell mainly commercial breeding um, animals and store animals, along with some pedigree Cheviots from the stud flock and some pedigree highlanders, um, males and females. It's, it's pretty much a, a low input system. 
we try to combine traditional health farming practices with modern technology. We do a lot of performance recording, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, well, we, we both are really passionate about ways how we can combine farming practices that deliver uh, environmental and climate friendly um, outcomes alongside helping us to, to manage a successful and resilient farming business. And we do a lot on the farm through agri-environmental management, um, some with grant funding help, um, but also we carry out a lot of trials that we just do ourselves to see what works best. Um, I'm, I'm also a part-time agricultural consultant, and uh, since March 2020, I've also been involved with the Farmer-Led Group Initiative uh, when I joined the Suckler Beef Climate Group, um, which some of you may have heard of. Um, that was the first of several uh, groups for each of the agricultural sectors in Scotland that were set up by Fergus Ewing um, to enable the industry to, to feed into future agricultural policy. And, and to design the policy so that it actually benefits the environment and climate um, by making sure that farmers can deliver public benefits whilst also being supported and rewarded for carrying out good agricultural activity. So after the suckler beef sector group um, reported on its recommendations, I then also joined the group that looked into um, hill upland and crofting areas and since then, I've been active on a, a program board that was set up off the back of the Suckler Beef Report, um, and that's been working with with Scottish government to to try and um, help them take forward the recommendations of of the farmer led groups. Um, and maybe more recently, and very exciting, I am also three weeks now into keeping my own bees, which I'm really enjoying. Although it is a very steep learning curve, and I have had some angry bees telling me off for not doing the right things, but we'll leave that. Thankfully, I don't have swollen eyes just now. So um, I, I wasn't quite sure how to tackle the, the, um, what to talk about for tonight, but I think I'm, I'm going to talk mainly about my, my background maybe, because it was the journey that brought me here that I think I gained most from, um, and that's maybe more interesting. Um, so yeah, just to give you an idea about my background, um, you can probably guess from the photos I didn't grow up in Scotland. Um, if the little Swiss flag on the dog doesn't make it obvious. Uh, I was born in Switzerland. I lived there for the first 20, 21 years of my life. Um, and I, I grew up in a lovely little village um, in central Switzerland, just north of the Alps, um, in the Rice Valley, um, but beautiful view over the mountains there. And at about 1,600 feet above sea level, which is quite high over here in Switzerland, that's still class lowlands. Um, and very fertile, productive farmland. Um, I'm sure everybody else will, will be envy now, envious now if I say I was talking to somebody last year and they were telling me they had taken 11 cuts of silage off their ground. So in one season, I should say, not over several years. Um, so moving on from that very quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm not originally from a farming family. Uh, at that time, I had no connection to farming. Uh, other than the fact that the village was surrounded by lots of small family farms in a really nice, beautiful patchwork landscape. Um, most of them were mixed dairy and arable farms, um, probably around 15 to 20 hectares uh, in size, which at the time was pretty much an average sized, normal, normal sized farm in Switzerland. And I guess my first step into the world of agriculture, um, apart from just living alongside farms, it was, it was quite a subtle but a hugely important one, I think, and one that needs to be taken on board more here in Scotland. Um, I, I was lucky enough to actually be part of a school and kindergarten system that regularly featured farming and food production as part of the curriculum in school. So I, and, and being involved in farming as I am now, um, I think it's often quite easy to take my understanding of where my food comes from for granted. Um, but unfortunately, there are many kids out there not from a farming background, and they haven't got the slightest idea of the process involved in, in getting their food on the plate. So that, that wasn't the case where and, and when I grew up, thankfully, we had to learn about the, the different Swiss cattle breeds that we had, what they were used for, um, mostly dual purpose, well, how we could identify, how we could tell the difference between them. We actually had to sit an assessment on that and draw a little patterns on cows. So there you go. 
Um, we would go on regular school walks to visit farms, see the cattle feeding operation in progress, help in the dairy parlor, getting involved during apple harvest, which was great fun. But we also had to learn you know, how to grade apples in the field, select the right type for different markets. Was it going for apple juice, for cider, for um, just table apples, first class, second class, et cetera, et cetera. And because this was a part of our early childhood, it was the, the most natural thing to know where my milk, my eggs, my beef came from. Um, and that's, yeah, that's something I really feel quite lucky about. Um, and it didn't just give me a basic understanding as a non-farming person of what farmers actually do, but it also gave me that awareness that the industry actually exists out there. There are farmers out there and that's what they do. It sounds probably a little bit silly, but if you don't know anything about an industry, you've never been out there to, to go and take a look at it. How often do you actually find yourself thinking about it and being aware of its contribution to society? Um, and I think allowing kids to grow up with that knowledge means that that the correct mindset is likely to be in place later on in their lives as well. So that connection then is there between the consumer and the farmer. And that's something I think is really important. I know I'm steering on subject here, but I think that was something that really influenced me uh, when I grew up, just that 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 awareness about the farming industry being there. Um, but anyway, it so happens that my mom then also met the farmer and married him and I ended up living on a farm. Uh, and I spent most of my teenage years growing up on a small mixed farm. And I think Marvin on the second slide, I've got some uh, photos, typical kind of postcard picturesque small family farm, as you can imagine it. Um, and a mixed farm was producing all sorts of stuff, arable crops, milk, pork, apples, other fruits, Christmas trees, the whole lot. Um, and I really enjoyed living there. Um, and thanks to the patience of my stepdad, um, who should be given a lot of credit for putting up with me. Um, I got to learn a little bit about farming, maybe not as much as I wanted to, but still something um, I got to help during haymaking. Um, I was driving an ancient Fiat tractor with a Dodge gearbox, so that was good fun. Um, stacking straw bales by hand in the loft on hot summer days, which was good fun as well. Um, helped fencing and milking and moving stock, feeding pigs. Got to know how to tell a good Christmas tree from a poor one, which I was really chuffed about. I'm not sure it's ever going to help me much again here on the hill farm. But it, it was a great and a valuable experience um, in a wider sense, but also for the career path that I've now chosen. Um, again, a lot to do with the mindset. Um, although at the time I wasn't, I wasn't actually interested, I, I'd never really considered to ever work in the farming industry, but that mindset allowed me to still enjoy working on the farm. Um, but I'd always followed another career path, and as long as I can remember, I'd actually wanted to become an astrophysicist, as, as you do, a very common career choice, I'm sure. Um, and I was extremely focused on this career path I'd always been more of a of an academic type, um, even though I enjoyed helping out on the farm. So finished high school, couldn't afford to go to uni just yet. So I got my job myself a job um, with the company's house in Zurich. Um, moved to the city as well, and that's when my connection to the countryside was getting lost a little bit during that time. But again, coincidences happen, and it just so happened at the time uh, my mum. <clears throat> took on a role as the secretary of the Swiss Highland Cattle Society. Um, you might not believe it, but there's over 10,000 Highland cattle in Switzerland, actually. They are very popular in Switzerland. Um, and they're also used to graze the Alps. Um, and that took place shortly after my stepdad had decided to sell his dairy cows following the dairy crisis, which, which Switzerland went through almost 10 years before the UK. So they decided to get some Highland cattle. Um, my stepdad really fancied to going back into cattle and maybe trying suckler cows. And um, then my mum was asked to attend an international conference and, and gathering of the, of the Scottish Highland Cattle Society. So um, I just decided to tag along because I'd always fancied a holiday in Scotland. Um, and it was, a, it was quite an amazing experience, which I enjoyed, even though I still wasn't looking to become a farmer when I set off on the trip. But it was good because it wasn't uh, your, your box standard tourist trip. It took me out to the countryside to see some of the real Scotland and meet some of its real people, so to speak. 
And I guess an important aspect of what eventually made me move over to Scotland was actually the fact that I felt welcome and comfortable, which is maybe a stupid word to use, but the, the social aspect and the culture was quite nice to experience. Um, and I should maybe mention at this, well, maybe I shouldn't, but I will. When I arrived in Scotland, I had actually been a vegetarian for eight years, um, not for health reasons, but as a lifestyle choice. At the time, I truly believed it was the right thing to do for the animals, for the environment, for the planet. Um, having read as much as I could, but just maybe use it under the influence of unconscious bias. So you're looking up anti-livestock magazines and books and websites. Um, but when I came to Scotland, I started to eat meat again during that trip when I came over, which partly was because um, when we sat down for dinner uh, in Stirling Castle and a beautiful Highland roast beef was served, uh, my mother leant over to me and whispered in my ear that she would disown me as her daughter if I refused to eat Highland beef at a Highland cattle event, which is actually true. I am not over-exaggerating. And partly because that day I had gone, gone in, on, on a, and visited a beautiful farm. We had gone and visited one of the Highland cattle breeders. And what I saw there were content healthy animals. They were grazing a natural landscape. And, and then in the evening, we had to be from that place presented on a dish in front of me. And that was, that was quite amazing. It, it triggered a bit of a mindset change because I, I suddenly realized, and I felt quite stupid at the time actually, that I could actually have the choice and I could choose to eat livestock products from non-factory farming systems that, that I can do that. I don't need to be worried and afraid about supporting a horrible, cruel industry where animals on some farms are kept in poor conditions. And that was quite, again, another important step, I guess, in my life, but it was that exposure to that situation that was needed for me to change my mindset and my thinking about it. Um, and yeah, it, it, it kind of made me take in a little bit more of the following two weeks I spent in Scotland. I, I set off just looking for a nice holiday, but then actually the kind of thought process has started. And then at the end of the trip, somebody said to me, um, had asked, oh, did you enjoy the, the trip? Well, if you enjoyed it, why not, why not come back to Scotland and spend a few weeks or months here and do a work experience? So being the proper Swiss structured and organized person that I was up until that point, I said, well, yeah, why not? Quit my job, started the work experience in Scotland. Um, off the back of that, um, that took me to several other places across Scotland and Wales. Um, then I decided I wanted to learn the theory behind what I was doing as well. So I went to college, uni, completed an honors degree in agriculture um, at the SRUC campus in Air graduated four years ago and since then I've been on the farm and doing my my advisory work um and I know I've, I've spoken mainly about my background but but it was it was really the, the, the journey that that was key to what's led to me sitting here now talking to you um and I think the the, the kind of the main parts of, of what's allowed me to take this career path there was a big element of luck no doubt about that. Um, but there are there are opportunities out there, but you also maybe sometimes have to make your own opportunities. Um, you've got to be willing to maybe sometimes steer away a little bit from from a pre-planned career path and sometimes make make some impulsive decisions. Um, very important though the help from others. I, I wouldn't have come half as far as I did without people that are willing to help share their stories share their experience and willing to you know put faith in somebody else the most somebody once said to me the most precious thing you can give somebody is your time and to actually have people in Scotland that were willing to give me a chance for a work experience in their farm despite me not understanding a single word of Scottish for the first wee while when I arrived here I mean I might as well have been Chinese um that was certainly a, a big big part of it um so yeah, it's, I think it was a case of taking advantage of opportunities that have presented themselves to me. Um, for example, going on that holiday with my mum, but then also actively looking for opportunities off the back of that. Um, one aspect of that, I guess, that gave me the freedom and independence to do that was after I left high school, I had to take a job because I didn't have the money for uni. Looking back, that was the best thing that could have happened. Um, you know, just 
before you get yourself into one set career path or, or further education, just get out there and do something. Do some work away from your chosen career path, something new away from home, away from the farm, different culture abroad. It's not always possible. And I know I was lucky to have that opportunity to, to get a decent job and save money and then just take off, basically. But, but it was quite important. And I think if you have that opportunity, definitely take it. Um, and then, yeah, accepting help from others, never be afraid to ask questions. I think that was another aspect that helped me hugely. If you don't ask, you don't get. It's a great saying that you Scots have. Um, and I used to be my tutor's absolute biggest nightmare. And maybe it would be nice if one or two of them could be listening right now because they will confirm that because I used to ask questions all the time if I didn't understand something at uni. So never be afraid to ask questions because half the time everybody else is wondering the same thing. Um, yeah, and then something else maybe just don't overthink. I used to overthink things a lot and then you become a little bit insecure and you wonder, oh, maybe I'm not that confident to make that decision. Just, just go for it. Um, looking back, it was quite some daunting decisions I made, but I just went for it. Um, and I think that, that's, that's made a huge difference. If I, if I was put in the same place again and I started to analyze and double guess everything, I wouldn't get anywhere. So um, I'm going to stop talking now because I think that's my 20 minutes up. And I'm not sure if I've achieved the objective, but happy to take any questions. No, that oh, sorry. I, I never even I never even prompted Marvin to go to the third slide. I'm so sorry. No. I thought I better include some photos of where I am now. So cows, dog, sheep, landscape, bracken, hills. It's a good, yes, it's a good, um, good summary of where I am now. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I've got a question here that's been put in for you. So in your role as an advisor um, or consultant, what do you think are the biggest challenges to encourage farmers and crofters to adapt to climate change and adopt climate friendly practices, technology uh, in the West Coast? And what needs to be done to encourage them to adapt? I think that's a really good question. Um, I see that was asked by Lucy. Lucy, that was a very good question. You could have asked me that over the phone so I could have prepared for that. Um, I think, I think first of all, um, and, I, and I was talking, um, or Ian mentioned something earlier on, my, my partner as well. You know, farming always gets the blame for everything. It's, it's a bit of a doomsday talk. Farming destroys the planet. Farming kills this. Farming does that. It's not just farming. The kind of core element is people, actually. We've got maybe too many people living in excess. And what you have to start doing maybe is, first of all, looking at an industry and recognizing what it's already doing. Um, the, the farming industry and on the West Coast, we've got many health farms that are low input and fairly natural, and they're already doing a lot. And we talk about degraded peatlands across Scotland, that is true. There's also a lot of undegraded healthy peatlands. So it's a case of actually approaching farmers and saying, this is what you're already doing and you're doing it well. And please keep doing it because it's important you do that. But on top of that, look, this is what you can also do. Turn it into something positive rather than always pushing everybody down and putting them down and saying, well, no, you're not good enough. and You're destroying this. And it's your fault and everything. And I think the other thing is just how you communicate it to farmers. Um, you know, for example, the the old blame game about throwing pesticides and fertilizer on. Well, that's off the back of, as far as I understand British history, people starving after, during and after Second World War, government throwing money at farmers to produce more and more and more. So farmers were just doing what they were asked to do by society and government. So it, as an advisor, you're in that kind of middle line where you have to... Um, try and formulate that a little bit different and have that story with a farmer, but it ultimately needs to come from government and the public. That support needs to come from there, from the consumer. And if the farmer doesn't have that backing, well, they'll just switch off, I think. I've not really answered the question, have I? But it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just having a conversation and showing the farmer, being encouraging, showing them all the things that they're already doing, that they're done well. Brilliant. Okay, 
Um, we'll move on to Jane now. Thank you very much, Claire. That was fantastic. Um, and then we'll have a, a chance. There's been a couple of questions come in from Lucy, but if anybody else has got other questions, you can you can pop them on the question and answer page or in the chat, and we can we can get them as we go along or afterwards. Um, so I'll pass you over to Jane now. Um, Jane, I don't have your updated PowerPoint. That's it. I can, can I share it myself? Yep, then? you can share it yourself. Yes. Yep, absolutely. I'm not sure what's going to come up when I share my screen. <laughs> don't know if it's open or not. Um, I just, there it is. Okay. Hold on two seconds. How do I get rid of that? So just extend the PowerPoint. I'm just trying to get so that I can make it go into a slideshow. There it is. Okay, then I can do it. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, and yeah, thank you for inviting me to do this. And um, it's quite intimidating coming after three such amazing chats and interesting stories. Um, but I shall do my best to tell you the story of where I've got to. Um, and as uh, Claire so rightly said, so often it's just um, about not overthinking and just going for it. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 the founder and owner of um, Highland Cold Ice Cream, which is based on Achenmere Farm in Barcaldon, which I was lucky enough to just be in the right place at the right time to get the tenancy on this farm. Um, I happened to be in Barcaldon looking for somewhere to live and also looking for somewhere to bring some ponies to when my now landlady um, decided that she was going to upgrade and was looking for a tenant. And I knew her from the past and she asked me if I would like to have the tenancy of her farm. So it was just a, an incredible uh, overnight um, thing that happened, which has been a life changing thing for me. I was at the time working full time as development and sustainability manager and leader for um, Denali Museum Castle and Grounds in Oban, um, which is quite a challenging job. And um, hadn't even contemplated the fact that I could have a farm. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a bit about my background and how uh, Highland, and, and then talk about Highland Fold Ice Cream because that's the, the diversification business that I've started from the farm um, and just tell you how I got there. Um, I was brought up in Glengarry in Lochaber. Um, we had a family croft there, which we ran an outdoor activity business from, and we had the lease of the 13,000 acres of deer forest um, where we ran trek, pony trekking and stalking and shooting and we had some fishing and boats and sailing and things like that for people to come and do. Um, everything was done the old fashioned way. We went to school in a rowing boat. Uh, we didn't have access by road. Um, we didn't have electricity. So it was quite a, um, an ideal childhood and upbringing. Um, and I moved to the Isle of Tyree in 1995, where I was for 20, 20 years-ish, um, with some ponies and ran a riding centre there. Um, and when I came to Barcold and I'd come back to the mainland for the job in Oban because my kids had left home, basically, and I thought it was time for a move back near my family. So, um, yeah, that's where I came from. We had a herd of um, Welsh black cows at home and we always had house cows for um, milk and butter and crowdy and things for the guests. And I started milking cows when I was probably about nine or ten. Um, so then I'd lived on Tyree for 20 years, surrounded by cows, but not having any and had a sort of aching for, to have some cattle for all that time. So when I got the farm, that was just amazing. Um, I started off thinking that I would do simlings and I bought some cemental heifers uh, from my landlady before she left and um, I, I bought a, a, a ling bull and then my mum who's in that picture with the dog um, who is my guru she is a farmer's daughter from wider and she's been my supporter and guru the whole way through this process of developing the farm 
Um, we went up to Dingwall to the Simling sale and upstairs in, in the Dingwall Mart, I don't know if anybody's seen it, but there's an, an amazing, or there was an amazing presentation by the primary school children about droving and the shielings and the dairy products from the Highlanders that um, used to be made in the old days and the amazing high butterfat content in the milk. And I was quite interested in this and I don't know what point the idea of making ice cream came. I don't remember that. I just remember seeing a lot of tourists stopping and looking at the Highlanders next door and thinking, missing something here. Um, anyway, I decided um, to go and do a one day ice cream making course down in Hereford that was run by some ice cream machinery people who were really wanting to sell me machinery, but they did a course to encourage you. And I came back full of inspiration and borrowed some Highlander milk from my neighbor and got a secondhand ice cream machine and tried it out and it was amazing. So that's where the whole thing started. And um, I then spent two years um, learning, researching, prepping, converting buildings I converted the old sheep shed into a cattle handling shed and I converted the old wire into a, an ice cream production unit and I had to go through an awful lot of hoops and hurdles with environmental health and planning and created a, a fruit garden for flavours and so on and so forth a lot of work and I had funding from the new entrance scheme the Scottish government um, new entrance scheme um, that was running at the time so, uh, and I was working full time. So I spent quite a lot of time um, completely exhausted and completely skint um, while that was going on. Um, the, I also had to, of course, um, source cows that were going to be quiet enough to train and train them for milking and go through that process as well. Um, but the outcome was that in 2017, just about four years from now, because I think I was trying to think today, I think it was the 23rd of August, the Appen Show, we launched Highland Fold Ice Cream. And that's my daughter in the middle and my grandson with the ice cream. Um, and we went to Appen Show with, I think, 14 pans of pure Highland ice cream made with Highlander milk and sold out. And it was the most fantastic feeling ever. Um, so we then did the same thing for Dam Alley Show. And then, of course, it was winter. It was the end of the season. Um, and for three years, um, Oh, that, I was, yes, I was just going to tell you a bit about the ice cream, the pure Highland ice cream, um, which because it has the 8% uh, butterfat content in the milk, you don't need to use cream. So you get this beautiful, silky, light um, gelato style ice cream and um, it's very white and very lovely. And we just flavour it with a tiny bit of vanilla and then make a couple of other flavours of Highlander with meadowsweet flowers and with mint from the garden and things like that. Not any strong flavours because the taste of the milk is just amazing. Um, so yes, um, that's the, we started with the garden, started foraging, started growing things and making syrups and sauces and toppings to go with the Highlander um, ice cream and then spent three years, 20, another two years, 2018 and 2019, um, on the road, going to every festival and show and um, games day that we could we could do. And I think in, nine, in 2019, we, we did 14 events. And then for 2020, we had 22 events booked. Um, meanwhile, we started developing a, a natural flavours range of ice cream, um, just because people kept asking for flavours. And I was determined not to flavour the, the Highlander milk. And it seemed such a waste to go to all that effort and then put the flavour into it. And also because there wasn't any way that I was going to be able to milk enough cows to provide the amount of ice cream that we needed. So we developed the natural flavours range, which is made with organic Scottish milk and organic Scottish cream and then all natural ingredients. But we make everything from scratch. So nothing is all about sustainable food. And I'm passionate about sustainable food. Um, there's no ice cream bases and ready mixes or anything like that. And we also had a lot of requests for non-dairy. So we started the sorbets and we do a range of um, sorbets made with fresh fruit and herbs as well. And we're now developing an oat milk ice cream um, because the poor dairy free people always say, we only get sorbets, we want something creamy that tastes like ice cream. So we started making 
oat milk with organic Scottish oatmeal, making our own oat milk and then making that into an ice cream, which sounds simple, but it's not. It's a very complicated process to get it as creamy as a milk based ice cream. And in um, in 2020, I had booked a trip to Italy to go to the Natural Gelato Academy in Grassetti. And of course, I couldn't go because of lockdown. Um, but I've been um, doing a lot of study with them online. They put all their courses online. So they teach you to make ice cream from scratch um, with natural ingredients. Um, for the winters, when we're not trading at events, I started making ice cream cakes and selection boxes and selling um, the selling ice cream that way. And the 2019 season was absolutely fantastic. We had so many Christmas cakes <laughs> to do, um, but also birthday cakes and all sorts of celebrations. Um, and my son's a, a graphics person, so he's helped me with all the um, branding and social media and my website and all those things as well. Um, so I've been very lucky with my, my family support. Um, I couldn't have done it on my own, all of this. Um, lockdown arrived um, and completely scuppered us because we had only events um, as it was coming into season. And we had 22 of them and they were all cancelled. So it was kind of crisis time. Um, my niece was staying with me. So we set up Scoop and Deliver and we ran up and down from Oban to Balahulish, um, taking orders and trying to keep ice cream cool and looking nice and delivering it to customers. And the support from the local community was absolutely amazing. People were just fantastic. And then started negotiating with um, Environmental Health to see if we could have some pop up sort of social distance ice cream outside thing at the farm and eventually um, by July they had agreed that we could do it um, and we got had an inspection set everything up and then we ran that at the weekends all the way through um, to the end of September and it was, it was amazing because we only had one weekend where there was a spot of rain the whole way through the summer it was dry um, and it was very well booked and um, we did really well with that. We sold some hot puddings and summer tarts and teas and coffees and lots and lots of ice cream. So that kind of inspired me to think about having something at the farm. I've been kind of holding out against having the sort of public selling point at the farm, but it was actually really, really nice. And so I'd been looking at the hay shed thinking that would be a nice uh, building. That's the one you can see with the door open in the distance. Um, so I had a bit of a chat with my landlady and she agreed that um, I could convert that for selling ice cream in. So the next few months or weeks really was spent creating an indoor space, um, partly as a cafe kind of place, but also as a base for people to come and pick up deliveries because I was kind of handing over boxes in the rain in the yard and it just wasn't very satisfactory when people were buying ice cream for gifts and things like that. So um, we got that open at the beginning of October and then had, I wasn't yet allowed to have it open fully because I hadn't got planning permission. So I submitted a planning application, but I could have some pop-ups. So we did that um, through the winter till Christmas. And then of course, lockdown came again and we had to stop. Um, and then at Christmas time, we heard the rumours starting that the events were all going to be cancelled again. And I, in a moment of madness, saw a lease on a, um, available on a premises in Oban and thought this is going to be the only way we're going to survive. So I put in for it and got it, which was amazing. So then the next few months, by this time I had reduced my hours. Um, I'd actually reduced my hours in 2019 at my work, but then lockdown came and they needed me. So I stayed on for an extra year. I planned to be finished full time work by the end of June in 2020, but that didn't work out. Um, so I was still working at Christmas. I think I'd given notice to the end of March. So then I was trying to get this ready for the season. And we did get the grants to help us, which was fantastic, and the bounce back loan. Um, and I set up Highland Fold as a separate company because we're now doing quite a lot of trade with wholesalers as well. 
um, and got the cafe open on the 21st of May. I didn't want to open too soon because this early season, I knew that the cafe would, the, the ice cream shop would have to be staffed and I knew that I had to make enough money to pay for the staff. So I waited until the end of May to get it open once the time was a bit busier um, and was really lucky with staff as well because we just put a wee thing on Facebook to say we were coming to open and we got uh, I got approaches from the whole team within 36 hours and they have been absolutely wonderful and um, so that's the shop and we're now open seven days a week and we're making all the ice cream on the farm and the girls um, spend some time in the shop and some time here helping me in the factory and some time in HQ at the weekends so then once we had this open, we started working on HQ here at the farm and um, planning application was, um, got the planning, I think it was at the end of June. And I decided that it would be good to have some socially distant spaces. So we did quite a lot of work in the garden. The farm's got a nice house, farmhouse has got a nice sort of um, mature, it was a garden with mature shrubs in it, not with flower beds or anything like that. So it's just kind of a, a quite a wild space. So we spent a lot of time creating kind of garden rooms in there with picnic tables um, so that people could get the ice cream experience but still be nice and distant and feel safe. And we planning said I had to put car park in, so we had to do that. Um, and then we put a nice path from the car park that's a, a sort of trail through the fields to to the shed um, to start um, selling ice cream there. And it's just a very different experience to the shop. So people come more as a destination and they have, well, they'll have a pudding and ice cream and then they'll have a coffee and then they'll maybe stay a bit longer and have another coffee or a nice cup of crofter tea from Rhoda, uh, which we sell <laughs> in both, both our venues. Um, so yeah, that that has been a great success. We just opened at weekends at the farm because we make enough ice cream to be open any more than that. And our little ice cream production factory is quite small. It's only really big enough for two people to work in. Um, so until we get a bigger space, we can't really do more than that. Um, the other thing that's happened over the time is that our wholesale um, partners, um, we've we've really grown the wholesale side of things. And that's been, as you can imagine, with the summer that we've had, incredibly busy. So we, car we carted 20 pans of ice cream to the Tyree and Cole Ferry the other day. And <laughs> it's quite a lot of work and it's, it's quite heavy work and it's quite hot work in the, in the factory for the girls. So... Um, yeah, we've been super busy. It's been a fantastic season. There's still a challenge of the long winters, um, but I'm now now that I've given up my full time job, I'm doing some consultancy and development and funding for community organisations. So I will grow that a wee bit in the winter, and um, just to su to sort of support the the business until we get into next season and get a better longer season. And then of course there's the all the work that needs to be done for the farm of just you know calving and feeding and training cows and I've managed to keep a couple of heifers every year to train up um, for milking which is just the bit that I love the most of everything and um, it's a very beautiful peaceful gratifying um, part of my job and um, just seeing them coming on and standing and it, it's just fabulous so I hand milk them hand milk them and um, the calves come in at night but they run with the mothers in the daytime so we just take enough enough milk for the ice cream that we need um, and uh, yeah so yes that's my story and um, what's next well um, a kitchen conversion I think I'll keep looking at there's a nice stable block here which is nice and big I keep thinking maybe we can have a new kitchen with enough space and maybe the factory that we've got just now can become an office instead of it being in my kitchen on my kitchen table um, and also in the business plan um, this, I put quite a lot of sustainability um, stuff in my business plan and um, having a sort of um, view to becoming carbon neutral over the next five years and yeah so that's yeah that's the story so far i hope that's been helpful and useful that was brilliant jane thank you very much you're very busy <laughs> head spinning 360 at the moment <laughs>
Do you find the Highlanders quite um, hard to train to, to stand to milk? No, not at all. They're absolutely... I mean, I was really careful when I was choosing them. I chose um, X show cows whenever I could, so they've been really well handled already. And if you and then the, my own ones, of course, I'm getting them really young, so they're and they're coming in as calves anyway. So the training process is as long as you just keep at it. Um, but no, they stand absolutely beautiful. I don't even tie them; they stand in their stall and get milked in the morning. So I have one cow who we called Ninja Cow, who I did train her to milk, but she. Never really liked it, but I've got two heifers off her, both of whom are really good. Brilliant. Um, um, Lucy's asking a question here. Um, how many cows do you milk at the moment, and do you see yourself expanding the numbers, um, or can you see yourself buying Highland cow milk from other producers? At the moment, I have eight trained for milking and I milk them three at a time so that I've got milk all the way through the year. I could milk four, um, but I've chosen not to just because of the capacity of what we can make and the time it takes and the relationship of the cows with each other to make it easy for myself when we're so busy. I would like to milk more, but I don't I need better facilities to do that. So that's another part of what's next. Um, I've thought about um, whether other people would produce milk for me, but I just don't think it would be viable. I, I, I think the costs involved of setting up and doing that work every day for the amount you would get for the milk, I just don't think it would be viable. I have thought about asking people if they would be interested, because that would be the perfect answer, is if I could zoom around in the morning with one of those tanks that goes on the back of your car and pick milk up from I mean, there are hundreds of, of Highland cattle within 20 minutes of me. Yep. Yeah. But I don't think people are going to want to milk their cows in the morning <laughs> and train them and all of everything that goes with it. What time do you have to start milking? I don't get up till half past six. I milk at quarter to seven. That's because it's only once a day and it does, it does, actually doesn't make a difference. I could milk them at midday if I... But um, that suits... Suits well. I don't. When the calves are little, um, I tend to milk earlier, um, just so they're not off their mothers for so long. In the depths of winter, and the calves are older, then they get left for longer. And is do you do you a quarter and leave a quarter? Two. Two quarters. Two. Yeah, depends on the cow, but mostly I take the two back quarters and and leave two. Oh yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Jane. That's a, a fantastic story um, of of uh, where you've come from and an idea that is a very unusual idea, I think. Um, but the ice cream is amazing, so I recommend everybody to try it. <laughs> thank you. So you could stop sharing your screen. Now. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. It's a nice picture of Daisy. So um, now is just the opportunity, but we've got um, a wee bit of time left just for, for questions um, from all of the attendees to, to any of the panellists. There's a couple that have come in from Lucy, um, and we could actually unmute people to ask the questions themselves if, if they want to do that. Um, so I'm probably going to just pop Lucy on the spot here because she's asked a, a few questions. Um, so I'm going to unmute you, Lucy, if that's okay. <laughs> and you can, ask, very much. <laughs> you can ask one of your questions. It seems like you're just listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you all very much, ladies. That was I was a little bit late to the party, so apologies for that, but um, some fantastic stories and really good to hear from you all. Thank you. Um, I'm going to choose my second question I think actually if that's all right and then this time I'll ask the other one but I don't want to hog, hog the floor as it were so with the focus in the last few years on women in agriculture um, with the women in agricultural task force the various reports and recommendations the FAS events the um, training funding that's been available for women and you know various other things what do you think has been the impact on women like yourselves involved in agriculture 
And what more do you think still needs to be done to encourage women to be more involved? Um, and I guess uh, from my point of view, particularly in relation to women in senior roles in agricultural organisations and businesses. So, so yeah, what, what's been the impact for yourselves and then what do you think still needs to be done and, and how can we progress that? Thank you, Morgan. Does anybody want to, to lead an answer? I've just put you all on the spot. <laughs> No. Clear. If nobody's going, I'll go first. Um, I think well, there's there's a few there's a few questions in there, so I don't think it's made a difference. Just ignore my dog; he's growling in some ghost that he's made up. Sorry. Um, I don't think it's made a difference to me personally, um, but I am maybe again in quite a privileged position where I am, um, and with the, with the people that I work with, what more needs to be done? I think. Um, mindset's always the key word. I would quite like, for to me, equality is achieved when gender isn't actually something we think about anymore. When we actually, we just look at somebody and see them as a farmer, a doctor, a mother, biologist, whatever they are. It doesn't matter if they're a man or a woman. It just shouldn't be, we shouldn't have to discuss it anymore. And that would be quite nice if we could eventually get to that point. Whilst still celebrating some of the natural differences and strengths we have as well as each gender. Um, that would be quite nice if we could get to that. Anybody else want to make any comment on Lucy's question? I was just going to say that I think in the, the Highland Castle um, kind of um, the world of Highland Castle, the I haven't found a difference between, I think Claire's right people, I don't think people are noticing there's so many women involved in Highland Cattle I don't think people really notice if it's a man or a, or a woman um, in that and I haven't really been involved in in the wider farming community but certainly I found that there's total acceptance of being a woman a woman with with cattle in that particular group of people which is excellent. That, that's what it should feel like for everybody. Yeah, I so think it's to... actually, yeah, a really interesting question because I guess, um, I, I, I'm so glad I went first because I just wouldn't have wanted to talk after these incredible stories about kind of size of crofts and enterprises and animals. And I think, I don't know if it's a woman thing or whether it's kind of a late entrant thing, um, but I, I often feel kind of, um, more put off by my lack of knowledge um, and the sort of scale I'm working at, I think, than than I do as a woman, if that makes sense. Um, the, you know, when you're kind of working with very small numbers and, and not a lot of knowledge, um, I, I think it's more that I never really consider there being a difference about being a woman, but definitely about the sort of like, oh, I, I wasn't born to this. Um, and and I've got a lot to learn. So um, yeah, so less less women and more sort of late late arrival. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a confidence thing, isn't it? In a lot in a lot of cases, and like Claire said, it's all about mindset. Um, for for a lot of people, just having the confidence to put themselves out there. Yeah. But I'll fix your computer for you. <laughs> I did. I, I had one wonderful moment, um, which which I always thoroughly enjoy telling, which was um, moving some stones for a soak away with someone else uh, in tidy. He'll remain nameless. And um, he was driving the tractor and I was chucking the rocks into the into the tipping box on the back. And then um, we finished the job, having done a lot of runs backwards and forwards. And he stopped and he looked at me. He stayed in the tractor the entire time. And he just looked at me and he said, oh, well, he said, you're as good as any man. So, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> Here's a call. It was. Do you know what? In that context, it absolutely was. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Um, so there's another question here from uh, Lucy again. If anybody else wants to ask any questions, you can. There's the raise your hand option, so you can actually ask your question in, in person, um, or just type it into the chat or the 
the the question and answer um boxes along the bottom um so the other question from lucy was um with the potential move towards a change in support payments after 24 how do you think this will affect your businesses um and what do you see as the main threats but also what do you think are the opportunities um and how do you think you will have to change what you're currently doing? These are very thought provoking questions, Lucy, <laughs> to put people on the spot with. <laughs> okay. I was going to say it, it's a bit difficult to know that until we know what the changes to the payments are going to be, and what we're going to get in replacement, if anything. I think having come in, for I said, kind of like kind of late and finally figuring out what the entitlements tick box meant on all the forms, um, I, I I find it a really interesting challenge because um, I guess it, it it's giving me a real kick to say, okay, how how do I make sixty acres work sustainably? What what can I what can I try? What experiments can I do to try and see if I can make <laughs> <laughs> make this this wee croft um kind of self self-sustaining um so i guess the opportunity is 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 creativity um but that's speaking from the very privileged position of of um having not relying in on the croft right now um so yeah it, the, the positive bit is is the chance to kind of like i guess be creative and you know you just have to listen to these conversations tonight to, to hear about the creativity that's out there Um, yeah, I'll, I'll maybe go on as Geraldine would like to go just now. Um, I think the 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 kind of the main threats. Um, well, we're we're on a tenancy, and our tenancy as it is just now runs out in November, and we still haven't got the new contract. Um, so that having to rely on somebody else and being restricted by somebody else uh, inevitably makes it a lot harder for tenanted businesses to actually have the, the, the ability and the opportunity to, to make changes that would be in their own best interest and in the interest of the taxpayer through policy. Um, and beyond that, the main threat, maybe not threat, but there is a danger that there is a lack of support from government. If there's no policy put in place and we are falling behind in Scottish government, um, nothing, nothing's come out yet and we are in what some people call a policy vacuum. Um, there is a distinct lean or kind of prioritization of woodlands over farming. There is a bit of an inherent anti-livestock agenda in some aspects of Scottish government, and those are potential threats if, if they come through in policy. Um, but then the opportunities, and I think Rhoda's put it spot on, you know, just focus on your own business and make it its own self-sustained and self-reliant bubble, so to speak. The less you're reliant on, on outside factors and, and outside inputs, the better. Um, I just thought um, Claire had a really good point there when we were talking earlier on uh, about farmers should be encouraged and told about all the really good things that they're doing instead of the total negative um, things that we hear all the time. And I think that would really encourage people to look closer at what they're doing and what they could do. And I think I think it's uh, it was a really good point. Yeah, I agree, Geraldine. There's a, a lot of um, farmers and crofters are doing a lot that they they just do automatically and don't realise um, the sort of good for the biodiversity and habitats and environment that they're actually already doing, and they're always just sort of we're, we're always the, the the bad side of things or, or things that are could be improved are always brought to the fore rather than what we're already doing well and um, so i think i think that's a, a really valid point that claire brought up earlier and without looking for brownie points marvin um i think events like this are, are, are really really valuable 
actually, you know, the the as Claire was saying, you know, not being afraid to ask questions, but the the also sharing the stories and the successes and like the struggles and and examples of what other people are doing is just so important. And I think that feeds back into the the question around women in agriculture as well, because I think, you know, there's there are great stories out there from women doing incredible things. And um yeah, finding ways to share them and learn from each other is is so important. Absolutely. That's very well. That's probably a, a fantastic point to finish on, to be honest, Rhoda. <laughs> um, if there's no further questions, um, of which there doesn't appear to be, then I'd just like to thank everybody for coming along um, and thank our four speakers for, for sharing their stories um, and all the inspiring and um, interesting and different things that they're doing and the, the ways that they go into to farming and crofting. Um, you don't just have to be born and brought up um, on a farm to, to become farm managers or to be consultants or to make ice cream. Um, it's it's uh, always good to hear what, what everybody else is, is doing as well. Um, just one last wee reminder, um, the evaluation form will be emailed out. If you if you could all fill it in, that would be fantastic. Um, and everybody that fills in the evaluation for, form um, will be entered into the prize draw for, um, I think it's £50 of vouchers for, um, you've got a choice of two different uh, bakery companies that you can, you can pick from. Um, so that is all for this evening and thank you all for coming.